Hi, my name is Greg Sturdivant. I'm a retired Marine Corps Major General, and I was the Commanding General of 3rd Marine Aircraft Wing Forward in Helmand Province from February of 2012 to February of 2013. I just recently finished reading Jeannie McKinney's book, Triumphed Over the Taliban, and I want to share three thoughts with you on my takeaway from reading that book. Number one, it's going to be my first and my last point. When you start reading that book, you're not going to want to put it down. It absolutely is riveting, and I appreciate the fact that Jeannie took the time, we're talking about nine years of research, to put this book together and really highlight the heroism of a number of Marines up and down the flight line the night of September the 14th of 2012 when we were attacked by 15 Taliban. That's number one. The second thing, I really didn't have an appreciation despite the fact that we'd had a number of conversations over how complex it was and difficult it was to put this story together in order to weave it together so it all made sense because there were so many moving parts over the course of that night uh, Jeannie did a masterful job with that. And then finally, one of the things I really appreciate was the fact that her investigative instincts caused her to continue to turn over one rock after another rock after another rock. All right, allow me to give you a little bit of background on the conditions that I experienced when I first arrived in Afghanistan in February of 2012. When I arrived, we had 17,000 Marines in RC Southwest, Regional Command Southwest, which was the Helmand Province. We'd gone from 17,000 Marines down to 7,400 Marines between February of 2012 and September of 2012. Our mission had changed. Originally, we were responsible for counterinsurgency operations against the Taliban. With the mission change, our focus shifted to assist and advise the Afghan National Army. So they were taking the lead, and we were playing more of a support role. When we first got there, we realized that security was less than perfect. And one of the things that my boss, Major General Mark Gaines, the Regional Command Southwest overall commanding general, realized was, or recognized, was just on the north end of the base was a shanty town that went right up to the fence line. And that was unacceptable because all of our deliveries came through that north fence line, that north gate, and you had to go through the shanty town, which uh, was less than ideal because you have no idea who's friend or foe. So one of the things that General Gerganis did was push that shanty town back approximately a mile and put them on, an, on the other side of a hardball road, a, a paved road that ran east to west. So that brought us a mile of open space where we could have good uh, fields of fire and fields of view. And you also had to do a serpentine to get in and out uh, of the gate. The east side of the base was a different story, and this is one where uh, that played a significant role in the night of the, uh, the attack of sem September the 14th. And this is one where General Gorganis tried repeatedly to get permission to make some changes on the east side of the, of the airfield. On the east side were poppy fields, and the poppy fields grew right up to the fence line. As a result of that, uh, it provided some, some cover and concealment for anybody who would try and do um, bad things to the Marines. It was that simple. So initially, when General Gerganis asked permission to, uh, he asked permission to plow the fields, and he was told no, he had to wait until after the harvest. The harvest came and went, and once again, he asked, it's time for us to go out and plow the fields. It took so long for that interaction to take place, that there was already a new crop planted. So once again, we were told, no, you can't do that. And oh, by the way, before you can do that, you've got to have the Afghans, we're going to put an Afghan face on, on this uh, operation. So the Afghans have got to go out and talk to the villagers and let them know that they're going to have to move. So that did not happen. All right, the next, th next time we ask, it was one of those where... Um, in order to do this, you have to have Afghan bulldoze, bulldozer drivers. We cannot do that. It's got to have an Afghan base. So repeatedly, despite repeated requests to make improvements on the east side of the base to open up the fields of view and fields of fire, General Gerganis was told no. Along the same time that he was doing that, I was asking for base security, uh, security improvements as well. And I made a number of submissions to the executive steering group, which was 
um, a body that, that had the approval authority for, for changes there on, on the base and just outside the base. Uh, my staff in early May of 2012 identified some significant security concerns uh, and it really focused on um, easy access to the airfield and the runway itself. So part of that request on May 11th of 2012 was for 10,000 linear feet of HESCO barriers. HESCO barriers are made of heavy duty cardboard and um, this wire, uh, mesh wire that goes around them. You've, you open them up and then you fill them up with sand and they become a barrier. In addition to that, we asked for 650 linear feet of, of uh, T walls, which are just like what you see on a highway that um, where you have a cement divider between lanes going north and south or east and west. So that also, um, we put that out there and that was denied. Now, despite that, there were still security improvements that we made every single month. And one of the things that we were required to do while we're in combat is do a monthly command chronology. And each month, we documented the security improvements that we were making, that stuff that was inside of our control was documented and is now part of a historical, a Marine Corps history. Um, a Marine Corps history. All right, so that's where we were leading up to uh, September the 14th of 2012. Approximately uh, 2200, which is 10 p.m., I got a phone call. I was sitting in my office. I got a phone call, and it was from one of the squadron commanders, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Stephen Beast Lightfoot. He was in charge of, of a uh, Marine Light Attack helicopter squadron. He called and said, we're under attack. I mean, I could tell by his voice as soon as I answered the phone, I, I thought there'd been a crash, there'd been a mishap. Uh, and I was sadly mistaken, or anyway, it was not a mishap. It was like, we're under attack, I gotta go. He slams the phone down. I leave my office, I run down the hall towards the Tactical Air Operations Center, and my uh, senior watch officers run in the opposite direction, you know, and we're both yelling at each other, we're under attack. And I want you, and I told him, I said, alert the flight line. And off he went to do just that. Next thing I did was I went back to my office and I called General Draganis over at his office, which was about a mile away, and let him know what was going on. And what had happened was we had 15 well-organized and well-trained Taliban come through the east fence, exactly where those poppy fields were, exactly where we had tried to get the poppy fields eradicated. They were able to come through a fence line between a tower that was unmanned and another one that had had guards that were asleep in it. They were undetected. They, they initially had the element of surprise, but as soon as the firefight started, that quickly evaporated. The Marines, the 3rd Marine Aircraft Wing, aviation Marines, put down their wrenches, picked up their weapons, and repelled the attack. In the end, they killed 14 of the insurgents, wounded and captured the 15th, and saved, basically saved the day. We had a quick reaction force. The United States um, Marine Corps had a quick reaction force as well as the Brits. The good news is they were able to go out and prosecute the, uh, or continue the attack and no one uh, got injured from friendly fire. Unfortunately that night, we lost two Marines. We lost Lieutenant Colonel Chris Otis Rabel, the squadron commander from the Harrier Squadron, and Sergeant Bradley Atwell, who was an avionicsman uh, from that same squadron. Within a couple of days of the attack, uh, Major General Reganis, uh put me in charge of security. And prior to that, we were working off of a 2011 memorandum of agreement, or excuse me, memorandum of understanding between the United States government and the Brits, all right? After the attack, I think, and I don't know this for a fact, but I think General Reganis just said, screw the MOU, you're in charge of overall security for this base, all right? And I, I got my commander's guidance and I took that for action. Uh, surprisingly, right after that attack took place and I took over, and this had nothing to do with me taking over, but it had to do with the attack. Surprisingly, everything that we'd previously, previously asked for was granted after the attack, right? Refused to do it ahead of the attack, the attack and mainly I think it was because of uh, uh, it was financial reasons. They didn't know if Bastion Leatherneck was going to be an enduring base. They knew Bagram was going to be, and they knew Kandahar was going to be maybe. And the maybe was it's either going to be Kandahar or it's going to be Bastion Leatherneck. What makes the most sense? 
So they really didn't want to put any more money into the base than they absolutely had to. And unfortunately, they made a decision that, that cost us um, dearly, not just in the destroyed aircraft, but more importantly, the lives lost. So now I'm in charge of security, and I got um, visits from a number of British generals, all right? And their position was they wanted to take over security once again, and it's absolutely not going to happen. They had lost our trust and confidence, and it was going to take them time to regain that trust. They were not going to get, they were not going to get the responsibility of taking over security again. Not going to happen. So after a number of visitors, I finally said, I will allow a British colonel to be my deputy. All right, that's as good as it's going to get. And that's where we left off. And I will tell you, so that, that uh, attack took place September the 14th of 2012. And when I left in the middle of 2000, uh, February of 2013, we had no further incidents on that base. Now, with that said, um, eight months after the attack, in May of 2013, General James Amos, the Commandant of the Marine Corps, decided, despite the fact that there had been numerous investigations immediately after the attack, that he needed to open his own investigation. 